Hello everyone, my name is Swasti and I work at the Manohar Parikkar Institute for Defence Studies and Analyses, the MPITSA New Delhi. While analysing the various verticals of how Europe is managing its security and economy, when faced with unending challenges that the war in Ukraine has landed them in, an interesting facet emerges. Europe's moral high ground as the torchbearer of human rights and a custodian of uh, democratic values versus its readiness to dispense with them under pressure in pursuit of economic solutions comes as a rather interesting case study. Let's understand how. Europe's approach to human rights has never been a more sticky wicket than now when the weaponizing of energy and attacks on its critical infrastructure has manifested its vulnerabilities like never before. How has Europe responded to these problems? Shedding the garb of a custodian of human rights and democracy Major European economies like Germany are recalibrating their approach to the undemocratic and illiberal but energy-rich Middle East. With the protracted and intensifying conflict in Ukraine, which is already in its eighth month now, the dwindling gas flows for months, the unprecedented sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines and the looming threat lest oil flows meet the same fate as gas flows that a recalcitrant Vladimir Putin has tapered down ruthlessly. Europeans actually seem to have little choice. The moral of the story for the Europeans, it seems, is that liberal values can wait but economic downturn will not. Let's see how intrinsic has been Europe's commitment to global human rights. The best way it could be expressed is uh, that Europe is guided by a human rights and value-based worldview when looking inward, but a dry pragmatism and national interest-based worldview when looking outward. You know, ideally, the value-based order that lies at the crux of Europe is meant to guide the EU's internal as well as external action. But a review of this policy tells us that nothing could be farther away from the reality. So, when it comes to Europe, values are upheld only so long as they are not coming in the way of Europe's own interests. Could this, in plain terms, be termed double standards? In my understanding, there has been a corporatization of the European democratic model. So, while there has been an impressive human rights clause in EU trade agreements uh, that you keep hearing so much noise about, but from a backdoor entry, they have made space for practicality as well. Let me tell you how. The EU 2016 global strategy document has used the term principle-based pragmatism, which in effect means that for Brussels, it's pragmatism, not principles, which is the final deciding factor. So the notion that Europeans give priority to their practical interests rather than values is actually quite correct. Since I was talking about Europe's response to economic crises that they are undergoing, this pragmatism versus principles duality has manifested yet again after the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz went touring the Gulf region in search of diversifying energy supplies. Let's see how Europe's interests are intersecting with other realities in the Gulf. Not far ago, when energy supplies from Russia remained steady, gas flowed happily enough through the Nord Stream 1 and a grand upping of supplies through the newly constructed Nord Stream 2 promised a furthering of Europe's prosperity sphere, then stability with Putin remained on high priority. Back then, EU and its major economies, uh, especially Germany and of course France, could indeed afford a moral high ground by joining the US in castigating Saudi Arabia for the infamous murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. I'm sure everybody has heard of this particular incident. So, back then, Angela Merkel's government was pretty quick 
to limit weapons exports to Saudi Arabia that had been rising dramatically. In fact, if you go by certain reports, it was estimated that the Middle East and North Africa region, the MENA region, had accounted for 40% of German arms exports by 2018. Further, in 2021, Merkel's cabinet approved a, a supply chain act, a law that places due diligence to enforce the protection of human rights and uh, environmental standards along global supply chains. And you know what the interesting bit is? At both these occasions in 2018 as well as 2021, the current Chancellor Scholz, who is touring the Middle East now, setting aside concerns for human rights, served as Vice-Chancellor to Merkel and the Federal Minister of Finance, you know, between 2018 and 2021. So this apparent U-turn in Germany's policy has come with the dreaded war that Europe thought was impossible and which changed everything in a jiffy. And I'm referring to what is happening in Ukraine. Let us see how the Europe Gulf reset has taken shape. Like I mentioned, German Chancellor Scholz recently paid his first visit to the Gulf countries, I think 24th September, uh, in a quest to seek alternative sources of gas as tensions with Russia continue to mount. He was not alone. A sizable business delegation with prominent private players also accompanied him on this trip where he met the Saudi Crown Prince, he visited uh, the UAE and also went to Qatar. With this visit, Scholz has joined those Western leaders like, for example, Emmanuel Macron and also Joe Biden, who are seen as resetting their attitude to Saudi Arabia post the Khashoggi controversy. This infamous murder I'm referring to again and again took place at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018 and led to a diplomatic crisis between Riyadh and the West. As a result, the crown prince was largely isolated on the international stage. So how does this balancing of mutually exclusive interests and values happen? It's something like uh, running with the hare and hunting with the hounds, you know. Being Europe's largest economy, Germany needs to secure new oil and gas supplies. But at the same time, it doesn't want to be seen as too soft in human rights violations. Therefore, the Chancellor's visits um, you know, to these three countries are being referred to as diplomatic balancing. Even though human rights abuses are a major issue in this region, Germany has steered clear of placing undue emphasis on them while exploring energy supplies options in the Gulf. And it's not just about the non-renewables, but Berlin is also on the lookout for sources of green hydrogen production using renewable energies that it may hope to source from the Gulf. Now, Saudi Arabia, which is an oil-producing state, aims to be the largest natural gas exporter by 2030, owing to its massive natural gas reserves. From this perspective, Scholz's visit to the region is definitely something which is a very timely endeavour. But the real feather in Scholz's cap has been his visit to UAE. You know, Germany and UAE have intensified their cooperation in the energy sector as Federal Economics Minister Robert Heibeck visited the Gulf in March this year. UAE is an attractive partner in energy trade, both for supplying natural gas to Berlin, as well as to enhance joint collaboration in hydrogen research and production. Heibeck's visit paved the way for German firms to sign at least five MOUs with UAE concerning hydrogen research and development. Therefore, it was in UAE that Scholz's visit proved most fruitful and markedly added to the groundwork that was laid during Heibeck's visit in March. The latest outcome has resulted into the German multinational energy company called RWE signing a deal with Abu Dhabi National Oil Company or ADNOC to deliver liquefied natural gas or LNG to Europe's largest economy by the end of this year. It is to be noted that the cargo which is to be delivered this year 
will be for about 137,000 cubic meters of LNG and will be the first LNG to be supplied to the German gas market via the floating LNG import terminal at Brunsbüttel near Hamburg, where a floating import terminal was proposed in February this year, in the wake of the European gas crisis and the war, of course. The deal with Abu Dhabi also includes an MOU for not just this year, but multi-year supplies of LNG. Two of Germany's new planned floating LNG terminals will eventually be able to receive up to 12.5 billion cubic meters of LNG a year, which is equivalent to about 13 to 14 percent of the country's gas consumption in 2021. Quite impressive. This marks an important milestone in building LNG supply infrastructure in Germany and setting up diversified gas supplies from the globe. Berlin hopes that more LNG deals on similar lines as with the Abu Dhabi will help ease the skyrocketing prices of energy. Now, Scholz also visited Qatar, which is host of the Soccer World Cup 2022 and has had a consistently poor record when it comes to respecting human rights. You know, I'm sure you all know that in Qatar, about 5,000 workers lost their jobs due to difficult conditions to prepare for the World Cup. While important clubs in Europe and the world took a stand on this issue, the European Union did not. With glaring human rights abuses, Scholz's visit to Qatar is yet again a delicate balancing act. But more dramatic events are to follow. After a successful visit to the Gulf, another disaster awaited Scholz as he prepared to return to Europe. A shocking, unprecedented turn in gas pipeline politics came about a couple of days after Scholz's trip. On 26th of September, mysterious ruptures were spotted in both Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines in the depths of the Baltic Sea with no credible explanation except sabotage of what could have led to these ruptures. The tremendous amount of natural gas spillage into the Baltic Sea ever since has severely complicated the prospect of gas flowing through the Nord Stream to Europe again. The emergency mode is on and the EU is rushing to ramp up its energy infrastructure security. Countries like Norway have already started deploying military capabilities to protect their oil and gas installations. On their part, Gulf states' persistent refusal to side with the West against Russia and more recently, uh, you know, refusing to ramp up oil production to ease the oil prices and I'm here I'm referring to the OPEC plus decision to actually cut down oil production. All this is less about pleasing or siding with Russia and more about a fundamental tenet of pursuing national interest. It is a reminder that states prefer a transactional approach to protecting their respective national interests by avoiding the costs of strategic alignment. Now, this is a point which is really well understood by India as we strive to uphold our strategic autonomy with respect to two different set of actors to cater to different set of continental and maritime challenges and aspirations. The takeaway then is that in the bigger picture of navigating the course of a complex intersectional global politics, such pragmatism remains key to understanding mutually exclusive but simultaneously coexisting contradictions. Only time will tell how effective the European strategy and resilience will prove. I'll be back to discuss more such global issues. Wishing you all a happy Diwali. Stay safe and stay tuned.